You know, some decisions in life just aren't that important, right? Red shirt or blue shirt? I, made it, I might have made the wrong decision this morning, but I think there's grace here for me for that. But you know what I mean, Coke or Pepsi, it's both a little poisonous, right? Or Dr. Pep, oh, I don't know. Chocolate or vanilla, you know, uh, some decisions, you're, you're, you know, you're okay either way. Sometimes we are faced with decisions that uh, we know can actually change the course of our lives, right? Do I marry this person? Uh, what school do I go to? Do I, do I apply for this job? Do I accept a job offer? You know, uh, we all have things that I think factor into the way that we make decisions. And some of those values guide us whether we realize they do or not. Um, and I think one of the things that, that really does guide us as we, uh, as we make decisions, big ones and small ones, is really has to do with what we think, like when we think of a successful life, what, it, what is that? Like, what does that look like? What does success look like to you? Um, you know, is that something that is maybe more centered around uh, home and family? Maybe it's something that's more uh, career, you know, kind of hit, hitting, hitting the next thing career-wise. Maybe, you know, maybe you're a creator and it's, and it's kind of making that, creating that next thing. I, you know, I will say, uh, this might be a controversial statement, but in maybe the pinnacle of modern American cinema, 1986, The Three Amigos. <laughs> now, did, did it win Best Picture that year? I, I'm not, I, it should have, yes. So, uh, now, you might not be familiar with that. It, so, short, sh- short version, right? Three uh, actors, kind of in the old silent film era of Hollywood, find themselves out of work, think they're on a great job down south of the border, not quite what they expect. But I say that because there's a scene in that movie where they're talking about what they're all going to do with that money, right? Like they're going to get this big payday, and what are they going to do with that money? And, uh, you know, Steve Martin says, uh, a big car, (laughs) like the big shiny car, I'm going to drive it around, Show everybody that, you know, show everybody, you know, I'll be a big shot. Um, Chevy Chase says, you know, I think I'm going to live it up for a while. Travel, maybe go to Europe, maybe, you know, spend some time in New York, throw parties, be a big shot. And then Martin Short, as Ned says, I'm going to use the money to start a foundation to help homeless children. To which, you know, the other two guys say, well, yeah, yeah, we're going to do that first, and then we're going to do the other stuff with the car and the traveling. So, you know, comedy works best when there's a little bit of truth in it, right? So, you know, caricature, uh, that, that's a little caricature of what motivates uh, people in our day, right? There's some exaggeration there. But I think a lot of people, a lot of people's idea of success does have to do with a status symbol, right? A, a car or a house or a job. Some people, uh, it really is more about, uh, you know, the, the experience, the, the travel, the things uh, that, that you might post about your life on social media. For, for others, it, it still might be um, doing something that, that helps other people, something kind of serving a, a greater cause, but the question is, does, uh, does God have something to say about this to us today? So that is where we are headed. And I have to tell you, friends, we have two weeks left in the wilderness. What? Two weeks left in the wilderness. We are almost finished with uh, the book of Deuteronomy. Now, um, we are going to kind of be crossing into a new section today. It's actually chapter 27. And what we're going to see is Moses is, is, is sort of setting up the decision for the people. Uh, another way to talk about this might be, what, what will success and failure look like to uh, the people of Israel? The people have a decision to make. Uh, and actually, it's going to be an ongoing decision. Will they love the Lord their God with all their heart? Will they listen to his commandments? Will they walk in the fullness of the promise of the blessing that God uh, promised to Abraham, uh, which included really was a was a big that was a big promise, right? 
uh, they, were, they were going to uh, really in, inhabit this, this Eden-like land flowing with milk and honey. They were um, going to be this nation uh, of priests uh, to, the, to the Lord. They were, they were going to be a, a blessing uh, to, to the entire world. Or not, right? Uh, are they going to forsake God's commandments? Are they going to instead choose to live under the curse? So in this case, uh, a successful life is going to be one in which they experience the blessings of God, right? We might call that living the good life. It's what Moses is hoping they are going to choose. Although Moses knows these people pretty well, he knows their past, he knows it's going to be a little dicey. But I think we should be able to connect to this a little bit because, you know, I think that's what we want too, right? However, we, we might sort of as individuals think about uh, success or what the good life is. Um, I, I think there's going to be something in this uh, for us today. So um, a, as usual with Deuteronomy, it might take a little bit of effort to understand what exactly is going on here. Uh, so we'll, we'll take some time to talk about what's going on in these uh, couple of chapters, this new section of the book. Uh, but really, sort of in, in, in this section, there's, there's a ceremony that Moses tells us about, and then there's some details on these blessings and these curses. So, um, so just to kind of set the stage, uh, what's going on here. Um, Deuteronomy is, uh, is, is essentially a, a written form of like a speech uh, or a sermon that Moses was giving. Um, that's, that's most of the book was, was a, a speech he was delivering to the people of Israel. His, his time is almost done. He's not going to be crossing over the Jordan into the promised land with them. And so, you know, this is really his last sort of plea uh, that, for, for, for these people. Um, some of this, you know, the uh, Deuteronomy kind of means second law. Um, it's, it's not a different law. It's just a second sort of reminding people of the law. Um, Moses is, is, is reminding them of the covenant God made with them at Sinai and, and sort of expounding on that in some places. So a lot has happened uh, between, in the nearly 40 years between Sinai and where we are right now. So um, I'm, let's uh, pray uh, quickly for, for God's uh, illumination, and then let's read uh, in Deuteronomy chapter 27. Heavenly Father, uh, we thank you for the day that you have given us um, God, thank you for uh, your church gathered together this morning. Thank you for uh, your word. And so, um, God, we pray that you would, uh, you would illuminate this text to us. You would uh, bring things to mind that, um, God, that you, that you would have for us, that you would do your work uh, through your spirit. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, Moses, uh, Moses is speaking here. We're going to start in verse 1 of 27. Now Moses and the elders of Israel commanded the people, saying, Keep the whole commandment that I command you today. And on the day you cross over the Jordan to the land that the Lord your God is giving you, you shall set up large stones and plaster them with plaster. And you shall write on them all the words of this law when you cross over to enter the land that the Lord your God is giving you, a land flowing with milk and honey, as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you. And when you have crossed over the Jordan, you shall set up these stones concerning which I command you today on Mount Ebal, and you shall plaster them with plaster. And there you shall build an altar to the Lord your God, an altar of stones. You shall wield no iron tool on them. You shall build an altar to the Lord your God of uncut stones. And you shall offer burnt offerings on it to the Lord your God. And you shall sacrifice peace offerings and shall eat there, and you shall rejoice before the Lord your God. And you shall write on the stones all the words of this law very plainly. So we'll stop there. So this ceremony uh, that Moses is describing what's going on here. So you might have picked up this is future instructions. Moses is talking about the day that they cross over the Jordan. So this is going to be a ceremony for the people after Moses is gone. This is also part of uh, something we've talked about a little bit, which is um, there's, a, there's sort of a form and an outline to the book of Deuteronomy that, uh, that is a, a reflection of, um, of treaties of that day in the ancient Near East. 
Now, so this is something they would have understood very well in this time and this place. And there was a form that would be used as uh, a more powerful king or kingdom would uh, make an arrangement or an agreement, or sometimes that's after conquering a smaller king or kingdom. And uh, so th there would be these parts of this, like there would be a history of kind of what the dealings of them had been in the past. And then there also would be some uh, sort of general stipulations of, you know, the, the, they'll be responsible for this and, and we'll be responsible for that. And then there was usually specific laws and regulations. Uh, and then there was uh, also uh, blessings and curses. Now, some of the curses uh, were uh, pretty gruesome for breaking the covenant agreements. And so uh, that is a lot of, uh, of, of chapter 28 of Deuteronomy. So before we get to that, um, we have this ceremony, right, that Moses is lining out this ceremony that Joshua is going to lead the people through. So there's these two mountains. There's Ebal, there's Gerizim, and, uh, and so the curses for breaking the covenant were basically going to be declared from Mount Ebal, and the blessings of keeping the covenant would be declared from Mount Gerizim. And, um, and so on Mount Ebal, we, we also see in verse 4 that Joshua is commanded to build an altar. Now, there's some instructions, some spe specific instructions about this. Uh, uncut stones, they, they, they're not cut or worked. Uh, field stones is another uh, way to say that. So uh, also the plaster and the writing and sacrifices. And uh, it's interesting, there was actually a structure discovered uh, back in the 80s on Mount Ebal. And, uh, and of course, you know, there's always a little bit of disagreement among experts, right? Nobody's going to point to that and say, for sure, that's uh, the altar Joshua built, but it's in the right place. It's uh, from the, the right time. It's not really controversial, you know, dating it back at least 3,000 years. Um, and so uh, it, it actually could be older than 1,000 BC, and that's kind of it from, from uh, ab above. And so that, that kind of what they think it might have looked like originally is uh, in the, this last picture, and so, again, it fits with, uh, fits with the description that we have here, fits with the description in Exodus of building altars without steps, you know, so there's kind of the ramp there that they would have used. And so there's, uh, you know, again, not, not that our faith rests on whether uh, archaeology backs it up or not, but it, it is always interesting uh, to see that. So that's... Um, but one of the things that that highlighted, at least for me this week, is is really there, there's a permanence. You know, there, there's, a, uh, there's, a, there's a thing about God's word that I think is comforting, which is that long after I'm gone, God's word is going to remain, right? And so even when you think about Moses, right? So Moses is giving these instructions to Joshua, and Moses is about ready. He's, he, he's, he's, uh, he's almost ready to exit uh, stage left. Moses never saw that altar get built, right? But he believed God was going to keep his promise. He believed God was going to bring his people to that place, uh, and he did. But even the people who built that altar, Joshua's people and the, and the ones that did, they were only the first generation of many, and even, you know, again, if those are the stones over three millennia later, still there, like, there is something that I think we should find comforting, um, that God's word and God's will is going to endure long after we are gone. Um, so another thing that I want to notice about, about this command is that uh, verse 8 tells us that the words of the law are to be written on this altar very plainly. So, like, it was meant to be understood. And that was true back then. It's true today. Uh, which means that, you know, there, there are going to be things in the Bible that we find that are a little more difficult to understand. But the, the deep meaning of, of the Bible and Bible passages is not hidden, right? Like, like, we don't believe that there's some secret knowledge or special knowledge that, you know, you can only get to if you kind of earn your way to the, you know, whatever level of, um, of Christianity, uh, you know, learn, learn the secret handshake and all that. Um, another way to say that is, you know, like the, the intent, the heart, the deeper meaning of Christianity is not behind a paywall.
Now, that said, it doesn't mean it's easy, right? Like, we do take into account that parts of this book were written uh, a very long time ago and in a language very different from our own. And I think also if we think about the fact that we believe the Bible is written for all people of all time and not just us Americans in 2023, then there should be parts that maybe are a little harder for us to understand but might be easier for people in other times and places to understand uh, also. So let's move on to the blessing section uh, found in chapter 28. So 28 uh, verses 1 through 6. So this is sort of just a, a, a summary of, of the, the life of blessing. And if you faithfully obey the voice of the Lord your God, being careful to do all his commandments that I command you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth. And all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you if you obey the voice of the Lord your God. Blessed shall you be in the city, and blessed shall you be in the field. Blessed shall be the fruit of your womb, and the fruit of the, your ground, and the fruit of your cattle, the increase of your herds, and the young of your flock. Verse 5. Uh, blessed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Blessed shall, be, shall you be when you come in, and blessed shall you be when you go out. So this is sort of how this passage is defining the good life, right? Like this is one, one way that uh, these people might view success. And I think we can probably understand the appeal, right? Uh, healthy family, you know, family multiplying, growing, uh, plenty of food, and not just food, but good food, you know, the Lord's blessing. Um, they're, they're kneading bowls, right, in baskets, kind of a cool picture there. Um, sort of a favor and blessing, goodness on them wherever they go, in the city, in the field, um, and, and even a prominent position, God raising them to a prominent position, um, setting them high above all the nations of the earth. And I think we can look at that and say that is good. But I also think as we kind of talk about that, that's where maybe we, we, we encounter a little bit of tension in the story. And I, I say that because... I don't really think anyone's going to disagree that uh, that would be like a desirable state of life, right? Like no one's, I, I don't think um, even the Canaanites, right? Like so the Canaanites whose evil had stacked up so long and so high that God's judgment was coming on them in the form of Israel would disagree with that. But I think the, I think, I think the rub kind of comes in verse 1. If you faithfully obey the voice of the Lord your God, being careful to do all his commandments that I command you today. Which kind of goes back to the heart of Deuteronomy, right? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength. And how, how, how do we do that? How, do, how were they instructed to do that? To show their love for the Lord? By listening to his commands, his laws, and by doing, like by obeying. You know, I think we see that in the first commandment. The first commandment's no other gods, right? And so the first curse that would be declared from Mount Ebal in Deuteronomy 27, 15, cursed be the man who makes a carved or cast metal image, an abomination to the Lord, a thing made by the hands of a craftsman, and sets it up in secret. And all the people shall answer and say, Amen. So the curses. Now, we find these curses for breaking the covenant listed in uh, 27, 15 through 26, and then 28, 15 through 68. Uh, some good reading this week if you want to read through those. Um, the curses in chapter 27 are a little different than, uh, than in 28. Um, but notice that uh, really the, the curses that are, that are in 27, uh, we can see them part of this commitment ceremony, right? Right? that Joshua leads the people in, the, uh, the curse is shouted, and the people say amen. We see that form in each of these verses. And so what we also see in these verses is it's really a reflection of the Ten Commandments. But if you think about it, if you just picture yourself there, functionally, you're with your entire family, your tribe, right, your clan, and you're, and you're crossing the threshold into the promised land. 
And after each one of these things, you are pledging amen. So you're, you're essentially, the people will be saying, yes, if we break the covenant, we are accepting the curse on us. And so, if, I mean, again, just picture, picture that for a moment. You know, you with all, all your tribe walking through there, cursed be the man who makes a carved or cast metal image, an abomination to the Lord, a thing made by the hands of a craftsman and sets it up in secret, and all the people shall answer and say amen. You guys want to try that? Can I, can I get an amen at the end of each of those? Amen. Okay, so 16. Cursed be anyone who dishonors his father or his mother, and all the people shall say amen. Yeah, cursed be anyone who moves his neighbor's landmark, and all the people shall say amen. Cursed be anyone who misleads a blind man on the road, and all the people shall say Cursed be anyone who perverts the justice due to the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow. And all the people shall say, Amen. So, I mean, picture that. Like, you're walking with this crowd, this huge crowd. And again, this is, I mean, in a sense, this is like a binding agreement that you are making. You know, you're, and, and again, something that's kind of interesting about this, these ones in 27 is there's definitely almost more of a moral weight to these than a legal. Um, meaning, you know, in, in other parts of the law, we find uh, more specific, almost like legal case studies, right? These are uh, things to help people ju make judges, uh, uh, make, make right judgments. But really, a lot of these have to do with um, things that are more, uh, almost, I would say, a heart issue, right? Because even like this, it says... Um, you know, in secret. And we see that, we see that in, uh, later on, too. So it's not necessarily like this is a law that's broken. This is um, how they're treating one another, right? Kind of interesting that, I mean, in all the things that they would put in there, misleading a blind man on the road would be something that God wanted to include in these top, you know, these top ones. I think one of the things that's happening here is, is God is showing his people that, you know, it's kind of the idea of God is holy. He says, you, you should be holy because I am holy. And so there's a, a part of that that it's a, he wants his people to have integrity. Like he wants his people to, um, you know, not just worship them with, you know, religious rituals and lip service, but to actually, um, you know, sort of be the same person in public that they are in private. I mean, that's not applicable at all today, right? <laughs> These silly cavemen back here? Yeah. No, I mean, I think we're, I mean, I mean we, have, we have infinitely more, uh, infinitely better tools today to present a different face to the outside world than we really have on the inside, don't we? So, uh, here in Deuteronomy, God, I, I, God's showing his people. He wants them to have integrity. That loving him with all their heart and soul and strength means that they're going to love their neighbor. Now, the curses in chapter 28 are detailed and intense. So, there's some important things I want to mention about that. It's odd. And if you, if you look at them, like, as moderners, like, some of that is even going to be offensive to us. But we should remember that this, the language that they actually use here is not so much different than what would be included in, in, a, in another treaty with, uh, between other nations of that day. Um, but one of the things that's interesting, too, is that in other instances like this, these, these types of treaties, they would really invoke the gods of the other nations to, to keep these rules. And so there, there was almost always a worship component. So, you know, if, if, if two uh, Canaanite, you know, kingdoms or, or, or nations were, were making a, a treaty, you know, there, there would be sacrifices, there would be allowances made to, to, to their sort of individual cultic gods. And it's uh, likely one reason that there's such a prohibition for God's people on making treaties with the people um, because that almost certainly would have involved them entering into some kind of 
uh, worship of these uh, other gods. Um, and so another thing to, to look at, um, and again, if you, if you read through all you know, 68 verses of the curses this week, uh, kind of picture it like this, that it's really like the unraveling of the blessing, right? So God promised Abraham that his descendants would multiply into a great nation. He promised Abraham that they would live in this really choice and beautiful land. Uh, promised Abraham that they would be uh, a blessing to all the nations. But these curses, uh, so if, they, if, if the people break covenant and disobey, right, the, the, they will shrink in number, right? They, they will be overtaken by their enemies. They'll even lose the land. They'll, they'll have to leave the land. I mean, there's also pieces of this that are like the exodus in reverse. You know, the, the, the people, the people's children would be taken into captivity. You know, where, where God rescued them out of captivity, uh, if they break the covenant and invoke these, uh, want to live life under the curse, that they're back into slavery, shrinking their uh, family, and ultimately losing the land, getting taken out of the land. Um. So another thing on this, too, is that as we look at these blessings and curses, you know, it's not necessarily granular um, or, like, individual. Like, like, you keep one command and you get one blessing, right? Or you break this command and you will suffer this one corresponding curse. Um, the, the way I think we're, we're supposed to read this is really, I mean, this is describing... Uh, life and existence for people. So those who love God with all their heart and their soul and their strength will find blessing. But if these people do not show their love for God by keeping his commandments and breaking the covenant, then really their whole life will be under the curse rather than the blessing. And that is up to and including their removal from the promised land. Now, I kind of mentioned this before, but I think here's the thing is nobody, nobody reads this and chooses the curse, right? Like, like in all of Israel, probably, I don't think they would hear these, the Moses is saying these things and they're thinking, curse sounds okay, right? I'll go with being destroyed by enemies and getting diseases and like my family dying or being taken captive. And again, I, I don't think the Canaanites would think that too. Like obviously they would, they want to be prosperous. And so I think what it really boils down to, and even as we pivot a little bit asking, you know, what what might this show us about how we define success in our own lives is, is this question. It's not so much whether you want the blessing or the curse, it's how you're trying to get the blessing. And that's one of the reasons that, you know, command number one is always worship the Lord alone. So don't make idols, don't worship idols. Like, that, like no other gods, that's, that's number one on the list. And one of the reasons that's number one on the list is because there's always going to be a temptation to try to get the blessing another way, right? An easier way from somewhere else. For the people of Israel, they're going into Canaan, which is like Baal country, right? And, you know, they had all these, you know, we talked about this uh, a while back, you know, all the... Asherah poles and high places and most of that kind of cultic Canaanite uh, uh, stuff involved uh, temple prostitution and all kinds of really uh, dark stuff, uh, human sacrifice likely in some places. Um, but the whole kind of thing was like, if you wanted good crops, if you wanted uh, your, you know, your family to uh, grow or whatever, like you would, you, you would sort of manipulate these gods in this way. You know, you'd give Baal what he wanted, and then he would give you what you wanted. Again, 
I mean, we're not tempted to run after Baal today, but I think there are lots of things that, again, we've talked about before that we will, we will run to without even thinking about it that we think is going to give us whatever it is we think we need to have that good life, right? And that's also um, why I think there's a mercy to be found in these curses. So... Um, so the mercy in these curses, which sounds weird to say, but these curses are not predetermined to happen. Like, like there's, the intent here is preventative, right? I mean, how many parents in the room, you know, when you tell your child or grandchild, don't play in the street, You're not saying like, oh, I hope they play in the street and I'm going I'm to get them, you know? No, you're, you want them to be safe. You, you want them to, you, you really want them to not play in the street. It's dangerous. And so the, 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 the force of this passage is not God sort of waiting up there saying, all right, guys, you know, kind of, kind of step up, you know, it's kind of like a cosmic game show of, hey, if you could pick the right path, then maybe, you know, maybe you'll get what's behind door number one. Or, you know, if not, like somebody's waiting back there with the buzzer, you know? No, like the purpose of this, the purpose, Moses' purpose in this is don't break the covenant. Don't disobey and rebel against the Lord or, or this will happen. God's not saying, just wait till you slip up and I'll get you. God is saying, no. He's saying, don't do this. Don't, don't stray in this way. Like, don't, don't, don't remove yourself from the blessing that I want to give you. And again, I, I think, I think all, of, all of us want a good life, right? Like, we want to enjoy uh, the blessings of the Lord. But we have, to be, we have to be really serious about the things in our life that will try to maybe circumvent that, you know? God, God didn't give me uh, what I needed right now, and so maybe, maybe I'll be happier if I just can get it from somewhere else. And again, we, we talk about these all the time, but we, we talk about them because we need to be reminded all the time, right? Maybe that's, maybe that's a job career thing. Like, maybe that's like, man, you know what? Um, man, I, I would just, you know, life would be good if I could just get into the career that I wanted to. Or family, right? This happens family all the time. Like, man, if, if, if I just had that person, that, 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 that person, that like, like then I, you know, or my, you know, my kids, like if my kids would just do, you know, be happy and healthy and successful and, and do all the things that uh, do, then, you know, then I, I'd feel like life is good. Um, And we slide into idolatry and we don't even realize we did it. And, and that's universally true, right? Like I can say that because I've certainly had times in my life where I, where I thought that was the answer, you know? And, and, and again, we don't, it's one of the reasons we have, to, we have to spend time with the Lord and we have to take thoughts captive and we have to, Think about what, why we're doing things because, you know, in the moment, you know, I, I, I didn't think, man, um, you know, if I just had, uh, you know, if my job just paid me uh, twice what I did, then uh, everything would be happy. And so I'm, you know, I've been praying that God would, would, uh, would, would send a, a check my way and he didn't. So I'm kind of just going to take it into my own hands. Um, or, or with, a, with people, you know? It's like we, if, if we sort of give up on God answering our prayers the way we want him to, do we try to take things into our own hands? And again, we don't, we don't think about that as idolatry, but that really is starting to set up uh, idolatry in our lives. So all of us as people, we, we have these things. And if you're sitting out there somewhere, and you're thinking, man, I've never, I, I've never thought that before. Like, I, I, I've never, I've never, I, I don't think there's anything in my life ever that has maybe 
tried to crowd out God from my heart a little bit, then um, uh, let's pray together after the service, and we'll see. We'll start asking some questions. Yeah. Um, no. Uh, we all have we all have things. Um, Every person who's ever been born has had that, except one, right? Jesus kept God's commands perfectly while he was here. And so in a sense, like we, we believe that, right? We believe Jesus lived a perfect life. Um, so we believe Jesus secured the blessing, right? Like the, that blessed life, Jesus, Jesus legitimately got that. And yet, if Jesus is the only one, then all the rest of us end up under the curse. So, you know, I haven't done this in, the while, in a while, but I, I used to occasionally do this. Like, you guys know the phrase, explain this to me like I'm five. So, um, this is also a plug. Uh, have you guys ever seen the biggest story book, Bible? So if you have, I don't know what, elementary age kids, um, it's, a, it's a storybook Bible. And, uh, you know, we, so, I mean, we like to use something like this and, and go through maybe one story a, a night with the girls. And um, so I just, I, I'm going to read a, a little selection from this book. By now you know that the biggest story is all about Jesus. He's our deliverer, our savior, snake crusher, and Lord. You also know that he's the fulfillment of lots of old promises and amazing prophecies. But that's not all. Jesus didn't just fulfill specific verses from the Old Testament. Jesus lived out and transformed the whole story of the Old Testament. Jesus was the long-awaited son of David and the long-predicted seed of Abraham. He was also the one to relive Israel's story and finally get it right. We might be familiar with this part of the story. Uh, Israel left Egypt. They crossed through the Red Sea and then wandered in the desert for 40 years. Jesus left Egypt in Matthew chapter 2, entered the Jordan River in Matthew chapter 3, and was tempted in the wilderness for 40 days in Matthew chapter 4. When Jesus was tempted in the wilderness, he wasn't just being tested by the devil, he was being tested like Adam was in the Garden of Eden, and like Israel was in the desert of Sinai, except where they failed, Jesus would not. Three times the devil tempted Jesus. Jesus hadn't eaten for 40 days and 40 nights. Why not turn these stones into bread, the devil hissed. Because man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the top of the temple. Why not jump off and let the angels catch you? Because it is wrong to put the Lord your God to the test. A third time the devil tempted him. Look at all the kingdoms of the world. Why not bow down to me and they can be yours? Because you shall worship the Lord your God and him alone. The devil wanted Jesus to clamor for bread like Israel had done and put God to the test like Israel had done and worship other gods like Israel had also done. Three times the devil tried, three times he failed. Three times the Son of God was tempted, and three times he passed the test. Jesus loved God's word more than he loved the easy way out. He trusted God's way more than he trusted the slithering serpent. Jesus knew his father was on his side even when it might not have felt that way, and that the devil was not on his side even when he pretended to be. Good story, huh? You guys remember where, uh, where Jesus quotes from? Where that man does not live by bread alone? 
Deuteronomy, right? Jesus fought the, Jesus come, uh, came back with a quote from Deuteronomy. Um, I really do think, you know, that third temptation, right? The devil promises Jesus all the kingdoms of the world, which is basically Jesus came to earth, right? Like that was the shortcut. That was Jesus getting uh, the kingdom without having to go to the cross. Jesus prayed that if there was any other way uh, that God would provide another way. And God didn't answer that prayer request the way that he wanted him to. And yet, so we have this example in Jesus of even Jesus himself was praying to the Father, didn't get the answer that he wanted at the time he wanted, and yet still was willing to, 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 to take the hard road, not wanting to take the easy way out. And so all of that to say, Jesus earned the blessing. We earned the curse. Galatians 3.13 says, uh, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. Verse 14, so that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. So, uh, friends, I'll invite the worship team back up here. And um, I mean, that's, I mean, that's our message, right? Faith in Jesus, period. Blessing, that, the blessing we didn't earn and uh, saved from the curse that we did earn. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, uh, we thank you for the lengths that you have gone to to have a relationship with us. Lord, what, an, uh, what a humbling thing that is. Uh, Lord, we, we thank you for, um, for the blessing uh, that has been secured through Christ that we can enter into by faith. Lord, please grow our faith in, in the areas that we uh, are most tempted to look for the easy way out, most, uh, Lord, Lord, tempted to maybe take a shortcut or try to find another way uh, to the things that we think might make us happy. Lord, help us all to, to, uh, to just get one step closer to finding our, our, our worth and our value and our contentment in you and you alone. And Father, I, I, I pray that for, for me personally first and for all my friends here as well. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.